In this presentation, we discuss sound waves. So we know that all waves come from some type of a vibrating source, and that's also true for sound waves. So in terms of the sound that comes from our voices, it's our vocal cords that are actually vibrating. We could also have a tuning fork that's vibrating. Vibrating guitar strings actually produce a sound. Um, if you were to uh, ring a bell, right, the bell itself is, is vibrating. So there's lots of different ways that we can actually produce sound. Sound is a mechanical wave. It needs a medium to travel through, and it can travel through any medium, a gas, a liquid, or a solid. We're most familiar with sound traveling through gas, like sound traveling through air. It turns out that sound is a longitudinal wave, which means that the disturbance of the sound wave is parallel to the direction that the sound wave actually travels. So there's a number of good um, demonstrations that you can see, um, and one of them I'm going to show with a quick FET simulation. In this FET simulation, we have a person who is um, listening to a speaker, and that speaker is inside of a box, and so we can hear that sound, so we're listening to the, the sound that this person um, hears. And we can take and remove the air from the box that the speaker is located in. And as the air is removed, the sound no longer travels outside the box. So even though the speaker is actually still vibrating here, there's no air for the sound to travel through, and therefore the person can't hear anything um, because of the fact that there's no air there. Sound waves are mechanical waves. They need a medium to travel through. When we take the air away, the, the air molecules um, don't have any material to vibrate in, and therefore you can't hear the sound. So in this particular picture, we study uh, sound waves in a little bit more detail. So here's an example where we have a tuning fork that is placed at the end of a column of air and the tuning fork is set into vibration, which is very similar to this picture down here. And the thing that we notice is that the sound wave is a longitudinal wave. The vibration or the disturbance is parallel to the direction that the wave travels. So here the sound is traveling down the column and the vibration is back and forth. A single air molecule is just vibrating back and forth. It's not traveling down the entire column of air. And, um, and we see that what happens is, is that the, the sound wave that's traveling in air here is occurring because air molecules are being bunched together, so here's a bunching, and then separating apart. And so the regions where you have a lot of air molecules together has a higher pressure, and regions where they're spread apart is a lower pressure. And the regions, regions of high pressure are called compressions, and regions of low pressure are called rarefactions. So sound traveling through, an, through air is actually a pressure wave that's traveling, and it's those changes in pressure that actually describe the sound wave. Um, the other thing that we notice is that the frequency of the sound is the same as the frequency of the source. So this is the end here is vibrating back and forth at a certain rate, and the individual molecules are vibrating the same as, um, in the same way as the actual uh, source of the vibration. So just like all waves, sound waves have a, a wavelength, they have a speed, um, they have a frequency, and so on. And so the wavelength for sound waves is measured be uh, as the distance between successive compressions or successive rarefactions. So basically, again, it's the length of a wave before it repeats itself again. The speed of sound um, can change, but in general, at room temperature, the speed of sound in air is about 340 meters per second. It travels faster in warm air, and it travels slower in cooler air. In general, the speed of sound changes by a factor of 0.6 meters per second for every increase in one degree Celsius of temperature. 
So I could figure out the speed of sound in air at any given temperature by taking the speed of sound at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, which is 330 meters per second, and then adding to it 0.6 times whatever the temperature is. Sound is going to travel at different speeds through different mediums. It actually travels the slowest in a gas. It travels a little bit faster in a liquid, and then it travels the fastest in a solid. And if you think about what's happening, the sound wave is actually a vibration that's traveling through the material. In a gas, the air molecules are not very tightly bound together, so that vibration comes from the molecules bumping into one another, and then that bumping occurs and it continues um, through the, for example, the column of air. In a liquid, the molecules are more tightly bound together, so if a molecule in a liquid starts to vibrate, it's going to immediately or pretty quickly vibrate the molecule that's next to it because they're more tightly bound. And that's so they travel faster. And then finally in a solid, you know, in solids, the molecules are very tightly bound. So if you start to vibrate one molecule, the one right next to it, since they're tightly bound, is going to vibrate almost immediately. It's going to vibrate much, much more quickly. So, um, so in general, sound travels the slowest in a gas and fastest in a solid. It needs a medium to travel through. So in the vacuum of space, there is no sound. It has to have some sort of a medium to travel through. And the air molecules don't actually move from one location to another. I sort of mentioned that before. They don't travel all the way through the whole column of air. They just vibrate about some equilibrium position. All right, so let's do an example of calculating the speed of sound at a particular temperature. So what is the speed of sound when the air temperature is 24.6 degrees Celsius, which is a little bit above room temperature? So we know the speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second plus 0.6 times whatever the temperature is. So I can put my temperature of 24.6, excuse me, 24.3 degrees Celsius times 0.6, and then I would have to add 330 to it. If I multiply 24.3 times 0.6, I get 14.58. I can add that to 330, and I get the speed of sound in air at a temperature of 24.3 degrees Celsius is 344 meters per second. The way that you can think about this is that for every increase of one degree Celsius above zero, the speed of sound increases by 0.6 meters per second. So at one degree Celsius, it would be 330.6 meters per second. And then at two uh, degrees Celsius, you would have to add another 0.6 meters per second and so on. So just to give a feel for um, sort of increasing speeds, and what the speed of sound is like in different mediums. In air, it's around 340 meters per second. That's about room temperature. And if that's not, if they don't tell us what the speed of sound of air is, the speed of sound in air is, we just assume that it's at room temperature, which is 340. In warmer air, it's going to be greater than 340. If you are in water, and I don't know how many of you have done this, but as a kid, I used to go swimming a lot. And I would go under the water and you like talk to somebody else under the water. And so you can actually hear the sound. And it start, turns out that sound travels about four times faster uh, in water than it does in air. And then in steel, it travels about 15 times faster. So uh, one interesting example of sound traveling through a solid would be like in an old Western movie where uh, a train, you know, there's train tracks and you want to know if the train is coming you can, a lot of times they would put their ears, uh, someone in, you know, in the movie might put their ear on the train track and they could hear that sound traveling through that steel and they would let them know perhaps that there was a train coming. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, um, but you know, basically sound is produced by a vibrating source. And so if you have a speaker, we all have speakers, we all use headphones and, and so on, but a speaker basically has in it a, a vibrating, it's called like a diaphragm in there, and it causes um, that speaker to vibrate, similar to our vocal cords vibrating, and then the air molecules next to the loudspeaker are set into vibration, and that, of course, creates 
compression and rarefactions and so on, and it sends um, information out. We could ask, you know, sort of how our ears work, and I'm not a biologist, but in general, what's happening here is, you know, the sound is coming to our ears, and the sound is a pressure wave. And so here's our sound wave, and we've got these regions of high pressure and low pressure. And so that pressure wave gets into our ear, and we have an eardrum. And that drum is activated by that pressure wave. So it's a causing a force on the eardrum, and it causes it to vibrate at the same frequency as the sound. Now the eardrum, here's the drum right here, is also attached to a bone inside your ear, and that bone vibrates and sends signals to your brain, and we interpret that, of course, as sound. It's interesting to think about those pressure waves that we hear in our ears, um, because it turns out, of course, we have atmospheric pressure. You know, we're, we're outside, there's air, and there's atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure is about um, 1 times 10 to the 5, very, very big number, Pascal. The changes in pressure that we actually experience at our ears are extremely small. I mean, I think they're of order like 10 to the negative, like 4 Pascals. So our ears can detect very small changes in pressure and, and interpret that as sound considering what the overall pressure is that we experience on a daily basis. If you wanted to find out some additional information about how speakers work, sort of provided uh, that information here, and you could take a look at it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Some other interesting information about sound waves is um, the frequency of sound that human beings can actually hear. And so human beings can hear a range from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. That's actual frequency. Now, if we talk about pitch, especially if you're a musician, you know something about pitch, but pitch is a subjective interpretation of sound frequency. So we might have a tuning fork that is set at a particular frequency, vibrates at a certain frequency, and someone might say something about its pitch. But pitch is subjective, so what one person might say is a high pitch, someone else might say, oh, that's only a medium pitch, right? So our ears are, are a little bit different in terms of um, all human beings have a different, a slightly different uh, range and, um, and, and just the, it's just subjective of what we think of in terms of what's loud and what's a higher pitch and a lower pitch. Below the, the human threshold of uh, our hearing range is called infrasonic, and then above the human range is called ultrasonic. As you probably know, animals, especially for example dogs, have a different range of frequencies that they can hear. So a lot of times, you know, you'll be at home or something, especially if you have a dog, and all of a sudden your dog will just start going crazy. And that's because they're hearing a pitch that you can't hear, perhaps something in a siren that's going by, um, or something to that effect. The other thing that's interesting about human hearing is that if you have a, a grandparent, or even a parent perhaps, that is hard of hearing, um, that actually happens, of course, with age, where we can't hear as well as we did before. And it turns out that as we lose our hearing with age, it's the higher pitched region that we tend to lose. And so if you have a grandparent that's hard of hearing, they may not, they may be able to hear a male voice, which is typically a lower pitch, much easier than a female voice, which is a higher pitch. And that's just because they've lost that higher pitch or higher frequency range. Sound is a wave, and um, we can have reflection of, of sound. And so if you are in a room, um, I, I always like to give the example of, you know, being in the bathroom or something like that in the shower where there's a lot of hard surfaces. And if you talk while you're in the shower, uh, it just seems louder. And that's partially because sound actually can reflect off of different surfaces. So one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later is something called the law of reflection. And this is actually true for all waves. So when a sound wave comes in and it strikes a surface, it bounces off of that surface at the same angle that it was incident. 
So we've got some incident angle here, and then it bounces off in some reflective angle over on the other side, and those two angles are equal. The dotted line here is a line that is perpendicular to the surface where the sound wave actually hits, and that allows us to measure those two angles and see that they are the same. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about this with other types of waves. There's also something called um, reverberations, which is basically the reflection of sound on multiple surface that can make the sound seem louder, but it, and it can also muffle the original sound. So what happens is, is that sound can actually arrive at a location at different times due to the different distances that are traveled. So if you look, I mean, it's kind of hard to see. I think this picture, which is animated, is a little bit easier to see, but we've got, um, We've got someone over here, like he, maybe this is like an opera singer or something, who is um, sending out sound, and of course it, it goes out in all directions. And one of the things you should notice is, is that that sound bounces off of the different walls. And because it bounces off of the walls, the sound actually reaches the mic at different times. And you can see those arrows are reaching the mic at different times. And so that can actually cause problems. It can make that uh, sound be muffled over here where the um, where the mic is if the surfaces are very hard. So oftentimes there will be padding on walls to stop this type of, if you were going to a concert or something like that, there'll be padding on the walls that will stop some of that reflection off of those surfaces and stop the reverberations. We're going to talk also about this a little bit more, um, but we can have something called diffuse reflection. And um, diffuse reflection is when the waves are incident on a rough surface, and they can reflect off the surface in many different directions. The law of reflection is still valid, but because of the imperfections in the surface, it causes the reflection to be all over the place. So this is a picture of a surface where we're looking at it microscopically. So it might appear to be smooth, but when we look at it more carefully, it's kind of got some bumps on it. So the red lines coming in here is perhaps the, is the wave. It could be a sound wave, it could be any wave. So here's the wave coming in, and when it strikes the surface, it reflects off of that surface. And so over here I've got, and the angle of incidence has to equal the angle of reflection, but I would have to make sure that I draw a line perpendicular to the surface to see how it reflects off. So there's a perpendicular line here, and then where this one hits over here, there would be a perpendicular line, and then the uh, sound would uh, reflect off here. And then I've got a sound wave coming in. It hits this part of the surface perpendicular to it, goes and bounces this way. And so the idea here is that all these sounds kind of go all over the place. And when the surface is rough, they don't all tend to go in one particular direction. So over in this picture, and this is not the best picture, but um, this is a very smooth wall. So when you have a speaker here, the sound hits and bounces off, and it, they seem to all sort of go in such a way that um, they're kind of, they're not parallel to one another, but they bounce off exactly um, at the angle they were incidents, even though they do over here but they're not sort of going in all different directions, and so the person can hear some of the sound bouncing off the wall, but not all of it. In this particular case, this would be a picture uh, where the walls are rough, so when the sound comes in, you know, you can have these big bumps on the surface, and so where the sound wave that was coming up here and bouncing off went sort of off perpendicular, here I've got a bumpy surface, so some of it, more of it can reach the person in that particular case. But diffuse reflection is basically where the, the sound hits a surface, and because the surface is rough, it kind of bounces off all over the place due to the imperfections. Uh, sound can also bend, and it's called refraction. And it's, refraction is actually the bending of a wave, uh, any type of wave, when it encounters a medium in which the speed changes. And that can happen um, for sound as well as any other type of wave. It happens for sound because of a difference in temperature. So in warmer temperatures, sound travels faster. And so let's look at the top picture up here and we can see what's going on. So here is a sound source at the top and here is a body of water. 
And near, so let's say that it's a very warm day. So let's say it's during the summertime. In the summertime, the body of water is probably a cooler temperature than the temperature outside. So there would be a layer of cooler air above the body of water and then warmer air kind of on top and near the, um, near the ground. So what happens is, is that the sound source is producing a sound that's traveling out in all directions. But because the sound is traveling faster in the warmer air, it tends to bend um, sort of downward, it's bending like this. Um, and so the reason for this, that, that this happens, the best explanation or one conceptual explanation for this is you can think about a toy car that's traveling from a hard floor onto a carpet and what can happen is it can change direction. So here's a hard surface over here and here's my little toy car. It only has two wheels and it's just easier like this. You could think this of the same thing as a wagon. Suppose that you had a kid and you were pulling this child in a wagon across concrete. So here's the concrete. And then all of a sudden you come in at an angle with this, with this wagon and you hit the, the grass and it's really thick grass. And so when you hit the grass, this wheel right here actually hits the grass first and it slows down while the other wheel is still on the concrete and it's going to travel faster. And so because it's traveling faster, it causes this wagon to bend its direction. And then once both wheels are in the same medium, they will travel at the same speed and it will continue in a straight line. So in the same regard, um, what's happening is with the sound is in regions where the sound is traveling faster, the um, the sound tends to bend towards the cooler region. So as a plane travels over, of course, it produces sound. In this particular case, I've got warm air on the top, cooler air down here. And so the sound tends to bend towards the cooler region. Here's another picture. The plane is traveling over, and it is uh, warmer down here and cooler up, up above. And so the sound tends to travel and bend towards the cooler region in this case, because it's traveling faster down where it's warm and it's traveling, cool, uh, traveling slower where it's cool. And this is partially why sometimes you can really hear a plane as it travels, um, as it goes over overhead, and then other times you can't hear it um, nearly as well. And it has to do with how the sound is bending and the temperature of the air.